good morning. It's uh, strange to be talking to you this way, looking at a, a video camera instead of at your faces, uh, but I am thankful for the technology available to us, allowing us to connect in some fashion. Above all, and first and foremost, I want you to know that uh, while we can't be together today, uh, your elders, your deacons, I myself, uh, we have all been praying for you. We have been asking the Lord's mercy uh, for health and for wellness for everyone in our congregation and beyond, of course, as well as for your comfort in the Lord. Uh, we've been praying for you. We've been talking with one another. We have, as we said in the letter that went out this week, we have met. Uh, we have talked about the current situation and the best way for our church to handle it. And the decisions that we reached, as were stated in the letter, were that uh, while it does sadden us, we will not meet together in any fashion, at least until the end of March. Um, in the meantime, we'll be meeting, gathering together at least uh, each Wednesday to assess the situation, to determine where things stand, how we're going to move forward, and of course, ultimately, uh, when we can meet together and worship again. Uh, in the meantime, should any needs arise, if you have uh, anything that you need, anything that we can do for you, whether myself or our session or our diaconate, uh, please don't hesitate to call or to reach out in any fashion. We'll be glad to assist you in any way we can. Uh, certainly be glad to pray if uh, needs arise that we can pray for. Um, this morning, we, of course, won't have our, our normal full order of worship. There will be several elements missing, uh, certainly among them uh, singing. You couldn't uh, pay me enough to sing on here. You can barely get me to sing on a Sunday, though I love to praise the Lord. I'm not, uh, I'm not much of a singer, and I'm certainly not going to do it here by myself. But I did want to uh, provide some psalms for you to sing, whether uh, on your own or with your family today. Uh, if you don't have a Psalter, uh, you can access these in various ways. Uh, you can go onto the App Store. I, I believe it's out there both for Apple and for Android. And for just a few dollars, you can download an app that is called the Book of Psalms for Worship. Uh, that is an app that has been put out by our brothers in the RPCNA based on their Psalter. A Psalter that includes, uh, I believe, nearly all or all of the Psalms from our own ARP Psalter, plus uh, several additional versions of many of the Psalms. Uh, you could also go out if you want a, a free app, you don't want to pay for one, you can go and download an app that is titled the 1650 Psalter. Uh, that's one I myself have and love to use. It is in the Old English, but the advantage of it, besides being free, is that all of the psalms are set to common meter, which means uh, if you're like me and not particularly musically inclined, or you just don't know the tune of a given psalm, uh, you can sing them all to Amazing Grace, for example. And so you could have the entire Psalter memorized to the tune of Amazing Grace. It might wear you out a little bit having heard the tune so much but you will be able to sing them at least and so those are various options um, if you don't want to go either of those routes of course you could just open up the psalms and, and read them which ones uh, well uh, thinking through our current situation i wanted to uh, call us to read and to sing psalms that are both familiar to us and that are particularly comforting at a time like this and so the two that i have selected for us to sing or to read this week are Psalm 23, uh, speaking of the Lord as our faithful shepherd who is always with us, a great comfort to God's people at all times, and which I believe will be to you now as well. Uh, and also Psalm 46, which we're going to read in just a moment here, but a wonderful one to sing, um, one that uh, Luther called his psalm, one that he wrote during his own times of trial, trusting in the Lord as our constant refuge and strength. Before we get to reading that, though, I did want to begin as we move from the announcement section, if you will, into more of the worship portion, I wanted to begin with a call to worship. And this morning, I've chosen to take that from Psalm 30, verses 1 through 5, words that are filled with praise and comfort. Psalm 30, 1 through 5, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my life from the grave. You have restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for a night. 
but joy comes in the morning. Praise the Lord. Well, as we ready to worship him, would you join me uh, wherever you find yourself this morning in praying and asking God to bless us as we consider his word and how we are to live in his world in light of his word. Our Father in heaven, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords, our great and sovereign God. You reign over the heavens and over the earth. Lord, you work out all things according to your perfect purpose, and you do all things very well. You are wise, and you are perfect in knowledge. You are holy and righteous in all your words and deeds, and you are powerful. Your purposes are always good, and nothing can stop you from accomplishing them. We thank you for the comfort that that gives in days like our own, that you reign on high. Not only so, but that you, who have all power, hold us within your grasp, and have said that there you will keep us secure and firm forever. Where a God like you, a Savior like you, is worthy to be trusted and worthy to be worshipped. So we pray that as we consider your word, as we read a psalm, as we think through our current circumstance and how your people are called to respond to it, we pray that you would fill us with love for you, that you would fill us with a strong confidence in you, that our mouths as well as our hearts would be found full of praise for you, and that your people might be faithful Indeed, radiant witnesses in a world filled with fear and uncertainty. May, may we be those who stand firm through faith in our God and who proclaim there is a Savior. You can know him. He is Christ the Lord. We pray, Lord, that giving us a solid and eternal hope, you would help us then to proclaim that hope to others and that a time like this might be used to draw them to yourself. We ask it for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, it is a strange format not having you here in front of me, not being able to see you, and so I don't know whether I'll preach as I go along here or more teach, uh, but probably more teach, and that not as we're accustomed to doing from a specific text, uh, but rather on a theme. It's the theme that I began to address in the pastoral letter that was sent out earlier this week, a theme upon which I now want to expand, namely how it is that we as the people of God should think about and respond to a situation like the one in which we currently find ourselves, where there is this unseen but nonetheless very real threat in the midst. We might turn to uh, many portions of Scripture, which would provide great help as we think through this. But I think that that psalm uh, that, as I've said, Luther called his psalm is a terrific one to read and to meditate upon as, as a general backdrop, uh, something that we want to have in our minds at a time like this. It is, as I've said, Psalm 46. It is the perfect, the pure, the inspired the authoritative and inerrant word of God, and it reads as follows. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning comes. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Amen. 
Well, it has been an unusual time. It's been a, a strange week, and nonetheless, in, in the midst of this week, our family uh, was blessed to be able to celebrate our son Abram's 10th birthday. Uh, it was a good birthday. We had a great time with uh, family. We enjoyed cake and all the uh, usual trimmings of birthday parties, but um, it was an unusual one all the same. It was uh, just our family, and of course, we were housebound, and we had the ever-present tension of this current circumstance always in the background. It reminded me of my own 11th birthday. I was uh, in Pennsylvania, of course, the time where I grew up, and that was the year, 1993, when Pennsylvania was hit with what is called the blizzard of 93. And my family and I happened to be at the airport at the time, and we were, as a result, trapped in the Pittsburgh airport. The snow came, the taxis shut down, there were no services to get you in or out, we couldn't get out of the parking lot, and so there we were, uh, a very strange birthday, being confined to an airport with uh, no extra family there, no friends, no cake, uh, no presents. And yet the, the strangeness of that day, it, uh, it came and went. The snow fell, Pennsylvania road crews, you know, they're used to that sort of thing. They very quickly had it cleared away. A day later, we were on our way home. Um, our current situation is somewhat different. But it isn't, some have said, looking like it will be so much a, a blizzard in which this threat, it just comes and it goes and all is better. Rather, they say we ought to expect perhaps more of a, a winter in which the threat will likely linger, at least in some measure, for a time. That sort of thing can wear on a person. Not knowing how long is this going to last, how bad is it going to get, not knowing when normal will return, and wondering when normal does return, is it, is it going to be the same as it was before? What will have changed? Of course, there are also the big questions that uh, humans have always asked, which, which really come to the fore at a time like this, questions people have about life and death, questions about eternity. All of it can be an awful lot to, to think about. And, and if we're not careful, it could weigh us down. And it could leave us just filled with, consumed by fretting. It could even drive us into a, a sense of despair. And, and yet we read the scriptures and we find that while God's people certainly go through difficult times and while they cry out at such times and, and, and don't try to ignore the reality they're facing, Yet despair and despondency is not to be the end of the Christian's response. And so the matter that I want to address uh, this morning, in light of all of this, is simply, well, what is to be the Christian response? How should you be thinking at a time like this? How, how should you and I look at this situation, understand it, and respond to it? What sort of thoughts, what sort of truths should fill our minds and direct our words and our decisions in the days and, and maybe even in the weeks ahead? Well, I gave four main thoughts in the pastoral letter that went out this past week, and it's those four thoughts that I want to address and, and expand upon a little bit now, uh, in addition to adding the fifth point that was, that was not in the letter, but which has been on my mind since then. The first of them, which was in the letter, is that at a time like this, it is important for you and me that we as Christians understand that the Lord, our God, remains now as always completely sovereign. That is, over all people, over all places, all things and events, over this virus, the sickness, over life and death. That's, that's not just the heart of the Reformed faith, though of course it is, but that is the heartbeat of the entirety of Scripture. Everywhere we turn, this is the great, indisputable, indispensable, constant fact. From Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22. From, from in the beginning God all the way to amen, come Lord Jesus. Our God not only is, he is absolutely, entirely, without exception, completely in control. He is working out his purpose at all times. And that means right now in this time. That's, that's everywhere implicit in Scripture. It's, it's often explicitly stated. Psalm 115, verse 3, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Psalm 135, verse 6, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does 
in heavens and on earth in the seas and all deeps. Of course, we love to quote as Reformed folk. We love to quote Ephesians 1, verse 11, and we often do so specifically in the context of, of thinking through salvation. But its truth extends far beyond that, beyond just salvation. It embraces all things. It tells us God works all things according to the counsel of his will. It can hardly be much plainer than that. Where, wherever you go in this world, whatever you find, whenever you find it, God is in control. He is in control. He is working out everything according to his good pleasure. There are no exception clauses. No, if, if anything, if anything in the entire world, in the entire universe, were less than entirely under the sovereign control of the Lord, the fact is, he would not be the Lord. He would not be God. He would be some creature with only part of the power, less than complete dominion over all things. And that simply is not our God. That is not the God of the Bible. Our God is sovereign. He is always working out his purpose. In Romans 8.28, that verse that we love to quote so much that we know by heart, it assures us this God who always works out his good purpose, his good purpose is to work everything out for the good of his people. It doesn't promise that you're always going to be able to read the situation in which you find yourself, connect every dot and say, well, this is exactly how God is working for my good. It doesn't say you're always going to understand it perfectly. It just says, even when you don't understand how, God is in fact working out everything for your true, your ultimate, and your eternal good. So that in the end, you'll be able to look back and, and find that everything you experienced in this life had a role in your God's perfect plan to complete his work in you, to shape you into the likeness of Jesus Christ, to make you more like his son, to make you holy. This being the case, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can know now, in this present circumstance, with this, this virus spreading through our land, we can know this is not a surprise to the Lord. This has not caught him off guard. It didn't find him sleeping. Psalm 121, verse 4, Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The, this virus has not upset God's plan. It is fulfilling God's plan. And it's a good plan. He can and he will use it as he knows best. He will use it for his good intention. And when he is pleased to do so, he will stop it. And until then, Christian, when, you, when you're tempted to fear or anxiety, know that the Lord, this great God who loves you, who gave his son to die for you because he loves you so much, this God is on his throne. But know that and, and be at peace. Our second response is a thought that was not contained in the letter earlier this week but one that I think is important for us to ponder at a time like this. That is that we need to understand that disease or pestilence, plague, these things being wholly under God's control, they're often presented to us in Scripture as instruments of the Lord, his, his judgment falling upon ungodly nations. And therefore, as a call to humble ourselves and to repent, the Lord spoke to the Israelites in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, a well-known chapter in which he contrasts the blessings that will follow faith and obedience with the curses that will follow rejecting him, wandering into sin and disobedience. And as he speaks of the various curses that will come upon those who refuse to walk in the way of the Lord, he speaks in a way that really ought to, to strike our ears in our day. He says, the Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. 
The Lord will strike you with wasting disease and with fever, inflammation, and fiery heat. Those are strong words. Uh, those are frightening words. And while my hope this morning is certainly not to fill anyone with fear, it is important that we, we think through everything, even a virus in the land, biblically. It's, of course, as we said, it's hard to read events in our world. It's really impossible, I would say, to read events in our world and say, well, this is exactly why the Lord is doing this. This is exactly what the Lord has in mind. The Lord at any given time has more purposes in mind than we can begin to conceive. But we can read his word, look at our world in light of it, and draw some conclusions according to what his word says. And what we see as we look at our present world is well, a world at large and, and our own country living in rebellion against the Lord. A people now faced with a threatening illness. The dots are really not that hard to connect. We murder our children in the womb. You might have seen a post going around social media this week. It's, I hope, not meant to diminish, or minimize the effects of the current uh, disease going around, but it did note that uh, were it to force Planned Parenthood to shut down for two weeks, it would in the end have saved more lives than it has taken. That is a disturbing fact. It speaks to the mass murder in our country of the unborn. At the same time, we flaunt and we approve of, of sexual perversion. We worship at the altar of entertainment so that people in a day without constant streaming sports are stunned, wondering what are we even supposed to be doing? We're consumed with entertainment, much of it ungodly. We live as if this world is all that there was, and there was nothing beyond it. And our universities promote the idea that we came from nothing. We've evolved from muck, essentially. We have no purpose, no meaning. We reject the living God, and we expect it to have no consequence. But he has plainly said, this, this will not be so. The people, the nation who rejects the living God, they will face judgment for it. Now, of course, we hear that, I know, and, and in our, our modern way of thinking, we tend to want to rationalize it away, to explain it away. Well, that, no, no, this is just the way things are. Uh, this is just what viruses do. They, they spread. It's not a religious thing. This is just science. But that's not the biblical response to a situation like this. No, biblically, when we see pestilence, sickness in the land, the response, the answer is to repent to confess that the wickedness of our ways and to call other people around us to do the same, to call out these sins for what they are, an affront to the God who made us and who has, who has so blessed our land. We're to cry out to him, to have, have mercy upon us, O oh Lord. We're to, we're to turn our hearts to the Lord and call upon him to turn others' hearts back to him, to plead with him, Lord, show patience, show long-suffering, have mercy. We're to repent and, and to wait for the mercy of God. Now, thankfully, along with this call to repentance, the Lord does give great promises to those who trust in him and his word. The promises don't mean we shouldn't acknowledge the reality of sin in our land. We shouldn't repent of it and call it out. But they do mean that even as the Lord sends judgment against the nation for its sins, those in the midst of the land who love him and trust in him and and seek to serve him, they can have comfort. Psalm 91 tells us, you, the people of God, you will not fear the pestilence. We can acknowledge its presence. We can acknowledge the sins of our land that deserve its presence, that deserve far more than just this sickness. And at the same time, we can have peace, knowing the Lord surely makes a distinction between his people and the ungodly. We can have peace even as we repent in behalf of our wicked and sinful nation. It's something that, that must be done at a time like this. We must repent. And then thirdly, back to the points that were contained in the letter. We must remember at all times, Christians, that our hope, our great hope, is not just that we will discover some cure for this disease but that we have an eternal inheritance. Of course, we desire an earthly cure. 
Right? It would be a strange thing not to. That That's very natural. There's nothing wrong with it. At a time like this, our our desire, our daily prayer should be, Lord, would you end this virus? Would you grant it to be contained, somehow diminished, or its threat abolished and ended? That's a right longing. But that's something for which you should be in prayer. That's something for which I know your elders and deacons are praying regularly. Lord, would you, would you slow, would you stop the spread of this disease? Would you allow treatment to be developed for it? Lord, please protect our people from becoming sick. I, I pray that for you every day. Lord, for any who have become sick or do become sick, please grant them healing. That's a good way. That's a loving way to think and to pray. And we should certainly want this to end as quickly as possible. With as little damage as possible, we should ask God for it. But at the same time, as God's adopted children, as people who are called co-heirs with Christ and citizens of a heavenly kingdom, we need to remember at all times, but especially at times like this, our greatest hope is not that this or any other trial will come to an end, that it will pass. Our true, our lasting and sure hope is that this, along with all things, will be used by our God to refine our faith, to make us holy and to prepare us for what lies ahead. Hebrews 13 verse 14 is a a wake-up call and reminder of sorts for God's people. It says, here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Peter likewise in 1 Peter 2.11 tells us, in this present world, we who are God's people are only sojourners and exiles. Writing as he often does, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. And why? Because, he says, the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Your true and lasting home as a follower of Christ, as a child of God, is not here. It is a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell, where there is no sin deserving of the judgment of the Lord, where there is no sickness anymore, there is no death. That's that's to be every Christian's constant driving hope. And it's such a great hope, Paul says, as he writes, that, that even present sufferings, even great sufferings about which Paul knew an awful lot, even great sufferings are not worthy to be compared with that hope. Whether sooner or later, heaven lies ahead for you, Christian. So when fears about the present or the immediate future begin to loom large, you need to fix your eyes on what is unshifting, what is eternal, on these glorious things to come. And take heart. Be encouraged. But the end for you is wonderful. We need to remember that. Our hope is a heavenly inheritance. And then fourth, a call to action, if you will. If there's much to give us comfort. There is, there is that in Scripture which would call us to repent. But there is also that which would call us as the people of God to action at a time like this. And so forth, we must call to mind at a time like this that the Lord our God, our Savior Jesus Christ, he has called us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And he has called us as Christians to be especially ready to show love and concern to one another because we are together the family of God. We are brothers and sisters. It's always important. It's especially important at a time like this when needs increase. When we're being asked to remain isolated from one another so that we can't interact in the natural way that we would. When, for a time, we don't have the blessing of gathering together to worship each week at a time when it would be very easy for us just to lose track of one another, to not pick up the phone, to not call because we don't have regular interaction, to not have any idea what's going on with one another. At a time like this, especially, we must think about how we can love one another. That's going to require wisdom. As I laid out in the letter, on, on the one hand, we're not to mistake a strong faith and confidence in the Lord as a reason to be needlessly cavalier in our behavior. That amounts to testing the Lord. 
right? ignoring precautions that we're being asked to take and using faith as the explanation. Right? We, we trust the Lord, but we don't walk out in front of moving cars. We trust the Lord, but we don't climb up onto roofs and leap off. Christ refused to do that, you remember, when Satan tempted him. Trusting the Lord is not contrary to exercising wisdom. And taking precautions to protect your own and others' health is perfectly consistent with strong faith in the Lord. And we must not become consumed with fear. That is not a faith. But even as we trust in the Lord, we believe that he will use this for good. Even as we look to him with a calm and childlike confidence in days like these, we should exercise reasonable precaution. And so out of love, not just for your sake, but out of, out of love for others and out of a love for God and a desire to honor this command he has given us to preserve life and not to kill, we need to use wisdom. We need to take what steps we can to avoid as much as possible spreading this any further. We're not to mistake confidence in the Lord as a reason to be needlessly and lovelessly cavalier. At the same time, on the other hand, we're not to mistake the need to exercise caution as a reason to forget the charge to love one another. We, we may not be able to see one another face to face for a time, but we can find ways to show love to one another. We can, we can pick up the phone, can call and just check in. How are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I need to pass on to the uh, officers of the church for you that they might be able to help with? We can encourage one another. First Thessalonians 5.11 tells us to do just that, to be encouraging one another. We can ask, uh, maybe uh, I'm going to the grocery store tomorrow. Could I pick up something and bring it over? Do you have needs? There are those among us who are perhaps are more susceptible to becoming sick and perhaps are more fearful of going out. Well, those who are perhaps less susceptible and stronger could take care of that for them. Any number of ways to show Christian love. Now, again, we should not put ourselves at risk needlessly, but there may be genuine needs, and those may require putting ourselves on the line a bit more than we otherwise would. We look at the church. We look at the church throughout the ages, and it has always been the people of Christ who are willing to, to put themselves on the line, to go where others wouldn't go in order to show the love of Christ and to meet needs when others are not ready to step up and do so. We're to be cautious, and that itself is an act of love, but we're not to be heartless. We're not to disregard one another and lock ourselves away saying, even though you have a real need, I will not help to meet it because I'm afraid. What if Christ had thought that way when he was faced with the reality of the cross? Right? They need saving, but it will cost me so much, so I will not do it. No, he, he didn't think that way. He didn't turn away. He didn't hide his face. He set his face, and he marched forward, and he suffered, and he died. He gave himself for us. Now, this is not a, a time for foolish risk-taking, but it might prove a time when the beauty of Christ's church, his bride, can, can shine, can be shown radiant in the world, when people can see the love that we have for one another as Christ said they would and know that we are his disciples and that he has loved us and come for us. We need to remember at a time like this to love one another, whether that means staying away and picking up the phone and calling or whether that means I need to go out and buy something and draw near in order to deliver it, whatever it means, let's not forget, Christians, this call to love one another. We need to remember it and then fifth and lastly, bringing it all together. Whatever tomorrow may hold, whatever opportunities or challenges, whatever fears may arise, we can and we should take heart in the knowledge that the future ultimately holds for us. The future holds a weight of glory that surpasses any present affliction for all who are found holding to Christ, hoping in him. That, that's, that's the thought, that's the sure knowledge that not only kept the Apostle Paul going during extremely tough times, great trials, it actually filled him with hope. Not just plodding along, but hopeful, joyful. He was imprisoned, 
and facing the very real possibility of death when he wrote those well-known words to the Philippians, which you've heard and perhaps love. He said in Philippians 1, 21 and following, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Paul's death was, was very possible at this point. He was standing on the brink of eternity. He was in prison. This, this, this wasn't theoretical. This was real chains upon his hands and feet. Death at his doorstep. And yet, he remained full of hope. Because he knew the worst anyone or anything can do to me is take my life. And if that happens, then I'm just being sent to enter into the presence of the Lord whom I love and long to see. That's to be our mindset. It was Paul's, and so writing to the Corinthians along the same lines in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, he could say, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. To be with the Lord, to be with Jesus Christ in his heaven, that is what awaits you as a Christian. It's what awaits all who belong to him. It's a hope that's worth enduring a hope that's worth waiting for. And it's a hope, as we fix our eyes on it, that's strong enough to enable us to wait. So at a time like this, what do we need to do? We need to fix our eyes upon the Lord, whom we will one day see face to face. Read his word and remember his eternal love for you. Pray, enter into his presence and rest there. Rejoice in the tenderness of his, his care for you, that he not only would die for you, but, but protect and sustain you, and give you great promises of hope to come. And then sing. Open your mouth, pray, express to him your gratitude and, and your love for giving you this hope. He says, it is kept in heaven for you. And then he says, you also are being kept by God's power for it. He's making sure no one can steal that inheritance from you. It will be there awaiting you. Christ has won it. And he's making sure no one will keep you from obtaining it. Because by his own power, he works faith in you. He will keep you going. Look to him at a time like this. He won't disappoint you. He won't let you go. He's the good shepherd. His rod and his staff, they are our comfort as we trod through the darkest valleys, even that one called the valley of the shadow of death. He is with us. His presence is our comfort. And his promise is that he will bring us through it all into the house of the Lord where we will dwell with him forever. Whatever the upcoming days and weeks hold, whatever tomorrow holds, he says this, as a Christian, is your ultimate and your eternal tomorrow. It is weighty. It is glorious. When you're tempted to fretting and fear, remember this. Fix your hope upon it, and you will find strength to stand firm in the face of every fear. Wish I could have Preach that message to you in person today. I can't wait until we can we can come together and see one another face to face. I can't wait until we, we participate in public worship together again, until we sing and pray together again, until we share in the Lord's Supper together again. But until then, remember and know that, that you are not alone and you are not without hope. But we have each other. Pick up the phone and make sure your brothers and sisters know that too. And above all, we have Christ. No one and nothing in all this world can steal you from his hand. and No one and nothing in this world can crush or take away the hope that you have in him. It is secured by his bloodshed in your place on the cross. Look to him, rest in him, and have peace. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for giving him to shed his blood for our sins upon the cross. We thank you that his death means our life. Because he died for our sins, they are paid for, and we will not face 
your judgment or wrath. We thank you that his resurrection, it vindicates him. It shows the sacrifice is accepted. And we know that as he has come through death, conquering the grave, so we too will rise again to newness of life. And you say this embodies like unto his glorious body, no longer subject to sickness or to death, but to dwell with you in a new heavens and a new earth forever, where the glory of God gives it light, where you dwell with your people, and where our eternal joy is to praise you with hearts made pure. Lord, help us to look forward to that day, and so to fear no day and no threat between now and then. We thank you that even now you're on your throne and working out your purpose. Let this be a fixed fact in our minds, as it is a stated and unchanging truth of Scripture. Let us rest in this reality and find hope. We ask this, we pray it as all things, not only for the good of your people, but for the glory of your name in doing them good. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you go out into another week, prayer for you is that our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ would direct our way to one another, and that the Lord would make us increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so that he may establish our hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. May he do it until we see each other face to face. May he bless you, may he keep you, and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>